The year is 2012. Trayvon Martin was gunned down in Florida at the beginning of the year. Lynn Sanity ran wild all over the NBA for some time. Gundam style took the world by storm. The mass shooting at a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado during a midnight screening of the film The Dark Knight Rises occurred, and Serena Williams won the US Open title. Serena Williams won in September of that year, but just a month later in October, Kendrick Lamar dropped what's regarded as one of, if not the greatest albums of all time with Good Kid, Mad City. Before getting into the album though, I would quickly like to plug that I made a TikTok that you guys should go follow. And if you haven't already done it yet, go follow my Instagram too, that would be greatly appreciated. You guys can always reach out and just show me some love. It's all good. Make sure to comment on what it was like for you in 2012 when this album came out and what was your reaction when you first heard it. The story of Good Kid Mad City dates back to 2011 with the release of Kendrick Lamar's debut album, Section 80, in July of 2011. This album sold 5,000 copies in its first week and peaked at number 113 on the Billboard 200. This by no means was a commercial success, but this was a stepping stone for Kendrick Lamar and with time, the album aged beautifully and grew in popularity. Now, there is some debate on whether Kendrick Lamar signed to Interscope Records before or after Section 80. Most articles and sources say that he signed after the album, but a frequent collaborator of TDE named Terrence Martin says otherwise. Terrence did work on Section 80 and went on to do work for all of Kendrick Lamar's projects after except for his last album in 2022. In 2015, in an interview with Uprox, Terrence said that Kendrick Lamar was signed to Interscope Records before they made it public. Despite this, he still dropped Section 80 independently. It wasn't officially announced that Kendrick Lamar and Black Hippie signed with Aftermath and Interscope Records until March of 2012. If Terrence is correct, that means that Kendrick was signed with the label before the release of Section 80 in July of 2011. When it was officially announced that Kendrick signed with Interscope and Aftermath, he said that he started to shop for deals after his 2010 project, Overly Dedicated. Dr. Dre of Aftermath Records and Jimmy Iovine of Interscope Records at the time saw the vision, talent, and potential of Kendrick Lamar all the way back in 2010. What we do know is that Dr. Dre, the founder of Aftermath Records, highly praised Kendrick after the release of Section 80. In August of 2011, West Coast legends, including the likes of Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, Corrupt, and The Game, symbolically passed Kendrick Lamar the torch of the West Coast. Visibly crying on stage, this meant a lot to Kendrick coming from people that he looked up to. Previous to this, the game had the torch of the West Coast, with him being the most popular rapper from the West after the release of his debut album, The Documentary, in 2005. His aim was trying to bring the West Coast back to prominence since they notably fell off after the 90s in the mainstream. But these legends passing the torch to Kendrick was a big deal because he was now the one to lead the charge on the West and he definitely did not disappoint in filling those shoes as we'll see. 
This was before Good Kid Mad City was released though, so it shows the faith that these legends had in Kendrick. In April of 2012, Kendrick Lamar released the song The Recipe featuring Dr. Dre. This was a street single and ultimately ended up on the deluxe of Good Kid Mad City. They come from, from all around the world. This was Kendrick's first single on a major label, and it was supposed to warm up fans for his sophomore album. Kendrick Lamar really thought that this song could have been a radio smash, but at the same time, he didn't really want it to be a huge hit because he didn't want to have to follow it up with an even bigger hit. He didn't want his career to start at a high point and decline afterwards. Producer Scoop DeVille did the beat and in an interview, he said that originally the rapper Stat Quo had the beat for the recipe. Ultimately, it ended up going to Kendrick, but it was also revealed by Punch, one of the co-founders of Kendrick's now former label TDE, said that there was a music video shot for the song. They did not like the final edit of the music video and decided to drop the music video for Swimming Pools, which was ready to go. The recipe was good for what it was, and although it did not chart on the Billboard Hot 100, it was the first time some people even heard of Kendrick Lamar, and it established a relationship between TDE and the radio stations. Of course, the big song that got a lot of people introduced to Kendrick Lamar was Swimming Pools Drink. This was the lead single for his sophomore album. Swimming Pools Drank was released as a single in July of 2012. It ended up peaking at number 17 on the Billboard Hot 100, becoming a hit. As of 2018, the song is quadruple platinum. Outside of the recipe, this would be the only other single Kendrick Lamar released before Good Kid Mad City. The hype for the album was building, and Kendrick assured fans that his sophomore album would sound nothing like his debut album, Section 80. During the making of the album, Kendrick went back to his old neighborhood and traveled to different spots that he used to frequent to get inspiration for Good Kid Mad City. In interviews, Kendrick explained that his sophomore album was about a kid that's trying to escape bad influences. While he's trying to escape, he's always being pulled back in because of circumstances that be. In October of 2012, Kendrick released Good Kid Mad City. The album peaked at number two on the Billboard 200 charts, selling 242,000 copies in its first week. The album was a huge success with Kendrick earning the highest first week hip hop album sales of 2012 from a male artist. One thing that I really like about Good Kid Mad City is the cover art. Kendrick Lamar has explained his decision to make a childhood picture his cover art. Two of my uncles, that's two of them. To the far right, that's my grandpa in a baby bottle next to a 40 ounce, next to a gang sign holding a kid. It's not just music to me. This is a story about the youth and the people that they call delinquents in my city. You look in the background and you see a picture on the wall of me and my pops. The eyes blanked out. That's for my own personal reasons. You'll probably hear about that in the album, but that photo just says so much about my life and how I was raised in Compton and the things I've seen through innocent eyes. You don't see no one else's eyes, but you see my eyes of innocence and trying to figure out what's going on. The deluxe cover of the album is of Kendrick Lamar's mom's van, which is a part of the overall story of the album. Also, fun fact, Schoolboy Q did the handwriting on both of the covers of the album. When discussing Good Kid Mad City, Kendrick described it as a dark movie album. He wanted to tap into that space where he was in his teenage years. He had plans for the album years before it came out in 2012. Everything was premeditated. He had the topic, album cover, and what he was going to convey on the album already down. According to Mix by Ali, TDE's mixer and engineer, the album takes place in 2004. This means that Kendrick was around 16 or 17, depending on where it's based in 2004, since he was born in June of 1987. The title Good Kid Mad City plays a huge role in the album because that's exactly what Kendrick was, a good kid in a mad city like Compton, California that is known for violence. 
However, Good Kid Mad City was not a new name that Kendrick Lamar came up with because back in 2009, on the first track of the Kendrick Lamar EP, Is It Love, Kendrick said that he was the good kid from an ugly city. The name Good Kid Mad City has two different meanings though. Mad City means my angel on angel dust and my angry adolescence divided. If you listen to the album, you'll find out the reason why I don't smoke weed. Because once upon a time, you'd find stuff laced with cocaine and angel dust. That caused a reaction and I put that inside the song. That really happened to me. That's the reason for the title. These were the events leading up to the album and its release, but now it's time to tell the story behind each track. The album starts off with Shireen, aka Master Splinter's daughter, which is produced by the production duo The Business. The track starts off with a prayer, and after this prayer comes the only verse in the song. Kendrick opens the verse reflecting about meeting a girl at a house on El Segundo Boulevard in Central Ave, which is a major intersection in Compton. This is said to be a nod to the 1990 movie House Party due to Kid and Play both being interested in a woman named Shireen who's played by AJ Johnson. The same name that's in the title of this song. People have speculated if the Shireen that Kendrick is talking about in the intro is a real person and this is true. Although the first line of Kendrick Lamar's verse might reference AJ Johnson, the Shireen that Kendrick raps about is a girl that he grew up knowing. I was in Atlanta when the business gave me the beat. Immediately, I got a vibe where I wanted to talk about a specific girl back when I was growing up, a specific story that leads down the line into the album. I got the track and I started writing and I went back home and laid it down. These songs, they come naturally for me to write off the experiences I grew up with and the things I've been around. It was just what we were going through. It's easy for me to write real stories rather than making up a crazy story. The story of the track is that Kendrick meets a girl at a party who he keeps in touch with and eventually meets up with her with lust on his mind. He finally pulls up to her house when he suddenly sees two dudes in black hoodies. Kendrick immediately freezes and his phone rang and it went to voicemail. It was his mother calling him to bring back the car and his dad asking him about the missing dominoes. Keep in mind that these are his real parents on these voicemails. When speaking about the song, Punch said that the version that we have today is possibly the third version that was made for it. The first two versions had different lyric changes, structures, etc. It was changed because of the basic storyline and how the story initially started from an awkward point. They wanted to have a song where there wasn't the hook breaking up the story. The sequencing of the album is important and that's what Punch also helped with. At the end of the song, Kendrick's dad tells his mother to play his oldies because she is killing his vibe. This then fades into the next track on the album, B Don't Kill My Vibe. Don't Kill My Vibe ended up peaking at number 32 on the Billboard Hot 100. While the song does not advance the story of the album, it's essentially about Kendrick Lamar's relationship with the music industry at the time and dealing with fame. A fun fact about the song is that Lady Gaga was initially supposed to be a feature. Yes, you heard me correctly. Lady Gaga, while discussing the album in an interview with Complex, mixed by Ali, said that Kendrick and Lady Gaga were in Chicago when they played the song for her. She wanted to hop on it but ended up recording her part overseas in Europe and sent them the files. Kendrick Lamar and Lady Gaga were going back and forth on the song and bouncing around different concepts about what they wanted to do with the record. The song ended up getting finished, but there was a timing issue with the album and it did not make the cutoff date. In November of 2012, just a month after Good Kid Mad City was released, Lady Gaga took to Twitter to post the original version of the song. Lord forgive me, Lord forgive me. Things I don't understand. Let me know in the comments how you feel about this. Speaking of Lady Gaga though, her and Kendrick were supposed to have another song on Good Kid Mad City called Party Noshes.
Before the release of Good Kid Mad City, the song was being hyped up and had a planned release date, but the track ultimately did not make it on the album. From what I've seen, this was most likely due to timing issues and creative differences. In my opinion, this track does not fit the vibe of the album at all, and I'm glad that it did not make it. Don't Kill My Vibe then fades into Backseat Freestyle. All my life I want money and power, respect my mind, no die from less shout. The track Backseat Freestyle is produced by Hit Boy, who met Kendrick Lamar a couple of years before he produced this record. Before Backseat Freestyle was a song, Hit Boy made a beat for Kendrick Lamar to make a song to, which Hit Boy thought that Kendrick would end up using. Unfortunately, Kendrick Lamar could not come up with the hook, so that killed the song. Later on, the two worked with each other again, and this then led to the creation of Backseat Freestyle. According to Hit Boy, Kendrick Lamar changed the beat that he gave him by looping a specific part from the beginning of the song to make the song that we have now. While I'm talking about Hit Boy, he's also said in interviews that Backseat Freestyle was initially for R&B singer Sierra who did a song over the beat titled after the producer. Very wild how Sierra almost got the beat. The title of the song Backseat Freestyle is about what Kendrick Lamar and his friends really used to do which was freestyle in the back of a car. This is how they started their day and it's how they took their mind off of things. The song is not from the perspective of present day Kendrick Lamar. It's actually from the mind state of a 16 year old and not having any care in the world. So this would explain some of the subject matter in the song. One thing that teenagers always have to deal with around the globe is peer pressure. And that's what the next song on the album is about. The art of peer pressure is where the narrative of the album truly begins to set in motion. It's one of the first songs that Kendrick recorded for the album. That's probably one of the first records I recorded for this album. Immediately when I heard the beat, I just want to take people on that ride, on that journey. It's about being a teenager from LA and being influenced by your peers and who you're hanging out with. I overcame peer pressure in my life because I had a father in my life. That's a big part of my life. I had respect for him. He wasn't right there. He couldn't be there all the time and he wasn't no perfect person. But at the same time, he had much love for me. He made sure I had a better life. He made sure I found that life through music. Kendrick Lamar notes that Backseat Freestyle is really the start to the art of peer pressure. The day starts with he and his friends freestyling in the back of a car, but afterwards comes the idea of committing a robbery, which he gets pressured to do by his peers. Money Trees is the fifth track on the album. Kendrick mentions past events that have occurred so far leading up to the song. Robbing the house on the art of peer pressure, mentions the freestyling in the car on Backseat Freestyle, and of course, the Shireen references littered throughout the album. After the events of the art of peer pressure, Kendrick starts thinking of how everything was about money. J-Rock has a legendary feature on this track and initially he wasn't even going to be on this version of the song. There were plans to have him on a remix but his verse was so good and fit the story of the song so well that they put him on the album version. There is an OG version of the song out there with no J-Rock and it has an extra Kendrick Lamar verse. Dreams of living life like rappers do, like rappers do, like rappers do. but for now I guess this sack could do. This sack could do. This the official version of the song remains to be one of Kendrick's most popular songs of all time. At a point in time, there was a music video that was planned for the song, but it never ended up getting released. While doing research for this video, I came across a post on Reddit where a Redditor talked about this. They said that they emailed the music video director to see what happened. The director of the Money Trees music video was planned to be Taj Stansberry. He's previously done music videos for the likes of Rihanna, Jennifer Lopez, Usher, Ludacris, Young Jeezy, etc. In reply to the Redditor, Taj said that the music video for Money Trees was set to be one of the best videos that he's ever done. Why it never came out was due to one slip of a permit and miscommunication which caused the police to get involved. This caused the police to shut down the second day of shooting the music video completely. Kendrick Lamar ended up going on tour the day after the original rap day. By the time that he got back, all of the steam was gone from the song. 
not being able to get the music video done is something that will bother Taj forever, especially with how popular Money Trees has become. Personally, I don't think that fans would not care if they got together and they dropped the music video next week. I mean, Chris Brown's debut album came out in 2005 and fans are still clamoring for a music video of the song popping to this day. Just saying, I think that it would still be cool to do a music video for both the songs actually. The story of the album though would continue with the song Poetic Justice, which features Drake. This is a song that is dedicated to Shireen. Before making the song, Kendrick Lamar and Drake had been working with each other for a while, with Kendrick being an opening act on the Club Paradise tour earlier on in 2012. When Kendrick asked Drake to be on Poetic Justice, Drake thought that the song was good, but it was just too typical for him. It sounded like something that he would normally do around this time in the early 2010s. This made Drake show Kendrick Lamar what would become Effing Problems, which did not make the cut of Good Kid Mad City. Instead, Effing Problems went on to beat on ASAP Rocky's album, Long Live ASAP. The song Poetic Justice was produced by Scoop DeVille. When talking about this track, he said that he was very surprised that the sample of the track even got cleared. Of course, the sample of the song was Anytime, Any Place by Janet Jackson. She co-starred in the movie Poetic Justice with Tupac, so you can see the reference there. At the end of the song, there's a skit that calls back to the ending of the first track on the album, Shireen, aka Master Splinter's Daughter. Kendrick was on his way to Shireen's house when he got stopped by two men in hoodies. The skit ends with the men telling Kendrick Lamar to get out of his mother's van. This fades into the track Good Kid, which is produced by Pharrell, who also does the hook on the track. Pharrell and Kendrick did about five songs together during the making of the album, but Kendrick grew a liking to Good Kid and knew that it would be the title track of the album. In the song Good Kid, Kendrick raps about being a good kid growing up in a mad city like Compton that's riddled with violence. In the first verse of the track, Kendrick alludes to getting jumped at the end of Poetic Justice when the men tell him to get out of the car. In the second verse, he raps about being negatively profiled by the cops as being a gang member when he's not. It's simply because of the color of his skin. In the third and last verse of the song, Kendrick raps the powerful line about the streets releasing the worst out of the best, which in this case is him. This then leads us to the track Mad City, which features West Coast legend MC8. The song peaked at number 75 on the Billboard Hot 100. The most hype moment in the song is definitely in the refrain where Kendrick raps about Pyros and Crips, which are gangs that are prominent where Kendrick grew up. The person who makes the ya 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 sound in the refrain is Schoolboy Q. This is the closest thing that he got to a feature on the album. Yak is one of his signature ad-libs and is his imitation of a loud gun sound. The hook of the song asking where someone is from is a callback to the skit on Poetic Justice when the men in the hoodies ask Kendrick where he's from. In his verse in the first part of the song, Kendrick references a real life incident that occurred when he was a nine year old. He saw a man get killed at a burger stand and bleeped out the name of the man who potentially did it. I'm bleeping out a name. These stories are serious and in depth. I'm not going to go out here and really, really slander and put my real ones out there that have been in some real situations. Those close to me know what I'm talking about. It's just about me seeing somebody get killed just as a kid and knowing and being right there and knowing how it all went down. Feel me. There is speculation from fans that this burger stand that Kendrick is referring to is Louis Burgers, which Kendrick mentions in the song Money Trees. On Money Trees, Kendrick mentions that his uncle Tony was murdered at Louis Burgers. The song Mad City switches up midway though, with the second half being produced by Terrence Martin. Kendrick looks at this as a stamp of approval by someone of MC8's magnitude being on the song. In interviews, MC8 has talked about how Kendrick wanted him on the song. He appreciated Kendrick paying homage to what he calls the hood level of music. In an interview with DJ Vlad, MC8 said that before getting in contact with Kendrick, he had no clue who he was. 
After hearing about who he was, he did his research and found out that he was also from Compton and was affiliated with Dr. Dre. He came in and killed his verse. In the last verse of the song, Kendrick raps a verse that he previously spit on the West Coast BET Cypher earlier on in 2012. The outro of the track continues the story of Kendrick being jumped while trying to visit Shireen. Soundwave, one of the producers of the track, said that Mad City had a BB King record that was the original sample of the song. At the very last minute, they found out that they could not clear the BB King sample, which prompted Soundwave to make a few phone calls to rework the record. The version of the record that we have now is said to be superior to the original version that has the BB King sample. Swimming Pools Drank is the next song on the album. Drinking is universal and Kendrick came from a household of people who abused alcohol. So much alcohol that it could fill up a swimming pool. I mean, on the cover of the album, there's a 40 ounce in the picture with Kendrick as a kid. Now being older, he had to make his own decisions and think about whether he wanted to follow down that path or not. Kendrick also addresses peer pressure once again, rapping about drinking to fit in. In the second verse of the song, Kendrick raps from the perspective of his conscience. While the record was produced by the producer T-, it ended up being mixed by Dr. Dre and Ali. When speaking on the song, T Minus said that when he made the beat, he thought that the song would go to an R&B artist, but when a friend of his played the beat for Kendrick, he loved it. The song Swimming Pools Drank ends with a skit continuing the story of Kendrick being jumped while trying to meet with Shireen. His homies comes up with the plan to get revenge on the men who beat him up. This plan ended tragically with the friend of Kendrick's name Dave ended up being shot and killed. This brings us to the 12 minute song, Sing About Me, I'm Dying of Thirst. Promise that you will sing about me. Promise that you will sing about me. This song and the entire album are essentially based on a true story. When questioned about the song, Kendrick said that in Sing About Me, I'm Dying of Thirst, he's breaking down the actual incident that changed his life. One of his friends really died in front of him and he was right there to witness it. Sing About Me is definitely a true song. Um, first verse is, is speaking from my partner talking to me, you know, speaking on the story how I was there, you know, when his brother passed and I got to watch him take his last breath and him respecting that, him, you know, respecting I was down for his brother no matter how much they called him a delinquent, you know, or such. And, um, him also recognizing the fact that this is his lifestyle, you know, he's going to do what he's going to do, you know. And I wish one day I can, I can see some positive, a positive light like you're doing the music, but this is me, you know. And if I happen to pass before your album drop, I want you to tell this story. Sing about me. Make sure you sing about me. And um, he definitely passed too. And um, that's what that story is really about, you know, from the first verse all the way to the second verse where I got the backlash. Keisha's song is a real song too. And what I didn't understand is the fact, you know, she actually had a, a, a younger sister, right? And um, I met her sister and she went at me about her sister, Keisha, you know, basically saying she didn't want her to put her business out there. You know, and if your album do come out, don't mention me, right. don't sing about me. The song is divided into two parts, with the first part being Sing About Me and the second being I'm Dying of Thirst. The song revisits what Kendrick said on Money Trees regarding everybody respecting the shooter, but the one in front of the gun lives forever. The shooter gets respect or temporary attention for committing murder, but it's the person who gets shot and killed that gets immortalized forever. They are the ones who will be remembered for eternity. The second verse of the song is from the perspective of Keisha's sister, as Kendrick said. For those who don't know who Keisha is, Kendrick made a song about her on his debut album, Section 80, called Keisha's song, Her Pain. Keisha was a prostitute, so in the second verse of Sing About Me, I'm Dying of Thirst, Keisha's sister is furious at Kendrick for putting her sister on blast on his debut album. In an interview, Punch revealed that Keisha's song was initially for Good Kid Mad City, but it was from a different perspective. 
The second half of the song, I'm Dying of Thirst, starts with a skit about how Kendrick's friends wants revenge after the death of Dave. Dave's brother is tired of running and he wants to go back and get revenge for what was done to his brother. On the outro skit of I'm Dying of Thirst, Kendrick's friends get approached by an older woman, one of Kendrick's neighbors. The woman sees that one of the men has a gun and she sees that they are dying of thirst. Instead of Kendrick's friends exacting revenge, they need to take a new path and let Jesus in in their lives. This woman then leads them in prayer. At the end, she tells the group to remember this day and that it was the start of their new life, their real life. The late Maya Angelou voiced the neighbor. There is a story of Tupac getting into an intense argument on the set of Poetic Justice that happened to be somewhat similar to what was said in the outro. Maya said that Tupac was furious and she talked to him to calm him down. Her words moved him to tears. In an interview in 2017, it was revealed that Kendrick took more than a year to write Sing About Me and Dying of Thirst. He started the idea and then it manifested into other things as time went on. Real is the next track on the album and this is when Kendrick comes to the realization of everything that he was doing. That's the start of me recognizing everything I was doing throughout that day. It wasn't real. Everybody has their own perspective of what a real dude is. Most of the time, a real dude is a street cat or someone putting in some type of work and doing violence. That's what we thought they was. Someone who's about that life. But on that record, it was me getting an understanding of what real is. And my pops breaking down on that record. It shows the influence he had on my life. Real is taking care of your family. Real is responsibility. Real is believing in a higher power, believing in God. The song also ties back to the voicemail that was left by Kendrick's parents at the beginning of the album. The ending of the song marks the end of the Shireen story on the album. The last song on the standard album is Compton featuring Dr. Dre and is produced by Just Blaze. This is the start of Kendrick's true life. The movie ends after Real and Compton is the next chapter. This song is very important to Kendrick because it was the first song that he ever recorded with Dr. Dre. It was the first time meeting him and actually walking into the studio and the beat for Compton was playing. In an interview, Just Blaze said that the beat was intended to be for Dr. Dre's scrapped album, Detox. If you want to learn more about that album, I've already done a whole video breaking down the entire history of the album, and I also talked about Kendrick's involvement in the album. Link in the description. Compton is a perfect outro to Good Kid Mad City, and we're not done because at the end of the song, there's a skit. In the skit, Kendrick tells his mom that he's about to use her van again and he'll be back in 15 minutes. This then takes us to the deluxe version of Good Kid Mad City, which cleverly adds 15 more minutes to the album. The first track on the deluxe is The Recipe, but I've already extensively talked about that track in the first part of the video. The next song is Black Boy Fly. The song is talking about everybody that Kendrick saw winning from Compton when he was growing up. He spoke about two people in particular, which were Aaron Aflalo and The Game. Aaron Aflalo played basketball at the same high school as Kendrick, which is Centennial High. Aaron Aflalo ended up playing in the NBA for over a decade. The Game, of course, is a famous rapper from Compton who was a mentor to Kendrick Lamar. As I said earlier, he was one of the people who passed the torch of the West to Kendrick. Wild Punch thought that Black Boy Fly was a really important song for Kendrick. He felt that it did not fit the narrative of the standard album, hence why it made the deluxe. The last track on the deluxe is Now or Never, which features Mary J. Blige. This was on the soundtrack to 2K14 for all of my 2K lovers. According to Punch once again, Jasmine Sullivan was originally supposed to be featured on the song, but Mary J. Blige ended up filling that slot. Now, there are various deluxes for the album outside of the standard one. There is the iTunes, Target, Spotify, reissue version, etc. For the video, I really just wanted to focus on the deluxe, which ends with Now or Never, but there is one song that did not make the album that I know people are going to ask me about. That song is Cartoons and Serial.
I remember when my brother played me this song back in 2012 when it surfaced online and I was blown away. The production, the message, Kendrick and Gunplay killing it, plus I was definitely a big serial kid back then. Cartoons and Serial was intended for a Good Kid Mad City, but it did not make the album because of sample clearance issues. Punch said that if they were going to redo the song without the samples, it would take away from the original feeling of it. This is something that they did not want to risk. The song features gunplay, which was Kendrick's idea to get him on the song. People thought that he was crazy for it, but gunplay absolutely demolished his verse. The song with uh, me and Kendrick Lamar, um, he, he reached out to me, I, I actually, you know what I mean? I heard I heard of him, but you know, he's, uh, uh, I haven't really, I didn't know he was that that big, you know what I mean? Honestly, you know what I mean? No disrespect. I didn't know he was that big, and he hollered at me and said, man, I'm a, I'm a real big fan of yours. You know, I listen to a lot of your music, and I would like to get you on the record. And, um, you know, I, you know I, I, I gave it right back to him, you know what I mean? I recorded it, I gave it back to him. It was fairly easy to do because it's touching on real, you know, subject matter. You know what I mean? That's the easiest thing for me, that real shit. You know what I'm saying? I could, I could, I could do that with my eyes closed. And there you have it, the story of Good Kid Mad City. This album has aged wonderfully with the album spending over 550 weeks on the Billboard 200, becoming the longest charting hip hop studio album of all time. This means that the album has charted on the Billboard 200 for over a decade, which is absolutely insane. This album means that lots of people, and upon first listening, you would understand why. Some people consider it more like a movie because of its sequencing and how vivid the story is being portrayed. I'm glad that I finally dedicated a whole video to Kendrick Lamar. I knew that I wanted to break down Good Kid Mad City, and here we are. All in all, let me know what you guys thought of the video in the comment section below. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.